Good afternoon. We are just about to begin this um, session of the Senate, followed by the statutory faculty meeting. Rob Keir will be presiding both of them in just a moment. We just want everybody to start taking their seats and, and start calming down because we are, have a very tight schedule. I very much appreciate your attendance by everybody here, both those of you on the floor and those of you up there. Good afternoon, I'm Robert Keir, President of the University of Oregon Senate, and I call this meeting of our University Senate to order. Our new business, motion to call a meeting of the UO Statutory Faculty Assembly, 30th November 2011, placed by the SEC, Senate Executive Committee. Do I hear a motion? Do I hear a second? All in favor, say aye. All opposed, nay. Abstain? So moved. No, not yet. M we have a second motion. Motion to call a meeting of the UO Statutory Faculty Assembly, 7th of December, 2011. Placed by the Senate Executive Committee. That meeting will take place here, 3 o'clock. Do I hear a motion? All in favor say aye. All in favor, all opposed nay. Abstain? So moved. Do I hear a motion for adjournment? A second? This meeting of the Senate is now adjourned. Please greet someone that we all care about deeply. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm here at, 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 at this convening of the statutory faculty to officially transfer for the purposes of this meeting my authority as president to Robert Keir, the president of the Senate of the University of Oregon, and to say thank you. I love you. Thank you. Actions speak louder than words. I would now like to say on behalf of everyone gathered here, on behalf certainly of all five constituencies, faculty, students, OAs, that would be offices of administration, offices of research, and classified staff, the most deep and heartfelt thank you that we could possibly give to any individual who we know now or in the future. Richard, you came here from outside of the state and you have given us the inspiration and the will to change. You have asked us to take our future in our own hands and now in this moment you ask us to go forward, go forward together and with resolute action and standing together to make that a reality. We have heard you as our president and will continue to hear you till the end of this calendar year, but that's not enough. We will now act to realize that vision that you have given us. That is our thank you to you and we are committed to it. From the bottom of my heart, and from all of us, you will always be our president in our mind and in our hearts. The vision that you have given us will make higher education in Oregon something that we can now all be proud of and which will become a model for higher education in this country. Richard, thank you so much. We owe you the greatest debt of gratitude. Richard LaRiviere is someone who also inspires us to look to our highest self for the integrity and the dignity and the courage that we all have. I would ask you please today to have a respectful dialogue with our guests, Chancellor Pernsteiner and State Board Member Linda Chufetti. We all know that we are disappointed 
shaken to the core, but we must look to the future as our president has implored us to do. So please join with me in having an open and respectful dialogue, which is the core of our shared governance system, our core principle. We will show our guests who we really are. Thank you so much for hearing my plea. If you would like to submit motions and have not already done so, you must sign up. Only the statutory faculty can make a motion, but if you're from another constituency, you can ask a statutory faculty member to sponsor or place the motion on your behalf. Uh, you can sign up here at the table if you would bring your motion forward. Um, we would like to have all of those prior to the place in the agenda where we'll actually be um, acting in, on the motions. Our next point on the agenda is introductory remarks from Chancellor Pernsteiner. Please welcome him with me. Thank you, President Keir, and thanks to all of you. Order, order, order. We cannot have disruption in this meeting. Order, order, order. If you force me to do this again, I'm going to call the guards. I have no choice. This is a parliamentary proceeding. Order, order, order. We must proceed. Order, order, we must move forward with this proceeding. Thank you for your participation. Now we will have introductory remarks from Chancellor Pernsteiner. Thank you again, President Keir, and uh, thank you for the reminder of the mission. I can't hear. You, oh. Could you, could you pull the mic forward? The podium. The podium. 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 Well, thank you again. And thanks to all of you for being here this afternoon. I know that you don't want to be here. I know that you are here because you care deeply. You care deeply about the University of Oregon. You care deeply about academic excellence. You care deeply about the spirit of inquiry. You care deeply about the students of the state. You care deeply about the citizens and the state of Oregon. That's why you're here. Thank you for being here. Thanks to those who reminded me of the mission, because their statement, the portion I could hear, talked about dialogue, talked about discussion, talked about the need to have the free interchange of ideas. And in fact, that's what we are here to do today and long into the future. We have not done that enough, and I own that. We will do it together. You care very deeply about this university. You care very deeply about its ability to make a mark, not just on its own students, but on the whole world. You help make 
that happen. I thank you. I know that you are disappointed. I know that you feel disrespected. And I regret both. That's why I'm committing now to spend much more time engaged with you in discussions and proposals about the future of education in Oregon. You notice I said education in Oregon because really what we have to be about is raising the education levels of all the people of the state in order to achieve the goals that have been set for us by the governor and the legislature. And it will take all of education to think differently, act differently, and focus on the future for our students. A key part of the success of this state is the excellence of and success of the University of Oregon. It is essential that we move forward together to make real the promises made by our state leaders with regard to education. It is essential that in doing that, we recognize the unique mission, the unique responsibility, and the unique opportunities that are really available only to the University of Oregon. Together, we can determine how best to both underpin the future excellence of the university and achieve the state's overall goals. We cannot do that in isolation from one another. We must do that in cooperation and in collaboration. I have spent the day today meeting with many constituencies across the campus. My role in that is to consult with them to understand how we best go forward from here, how we find interim leadership that will continue the momentum which you have achieved in the past. I recognize that President LaRiviere is a passionate, brilliant leader. I also recognize that he is a, has been a leader only for the University of Oregon. We charge all of our presidents specifically with taking the view of the entire system, taking the view of what is necessary in order to raise the overall educational attainment in Oregon. Each one of our campuses is more successful on every measure than it ever has been before. Without question, the University of Oregon shines among them all. But it is not alone in that. We will work together, all of us. That means, though, that we need to work differently, differently than we did in the past. We need, we need to focus more in our conversations about the uniqueness of the university, and we recognize the need to look seriously at governance changes that have been proposed by President LaRiviere. The Board of Higher Education has been considering those changes. The Board of Higher Education has advanced to, its next le to the next level a discussion of institutional boards. I encourage you to be participants in whatever fashion is appropriate for you as the Board continues that work. It is essential that we are informed by the wisdom in this room. But it is also essential that we are informed by wisdom from around Oregon. And we will be, I am sure. I hope, sincerely hope, that we can work together. That we can work together first to find a leader for the interim who will maintain the momentum, who will help us determine the future of education in Oregon actively. But we need also to work on those other things I mentioned. 
the focus on how do we sustain and support the unique missions of each of our institutions, because they all are different, and how we look at and determine the appropriate governance for the University of Oregon and for other universities in a world of the Oregon Education Investment Board and of 404020, both major changes in this past legislative session that will in fact alter forever the landscape of how education is governed and conducted in this state. I look forward to many communications, many conversations with many people in this room over the course of the next several months as we determine all of those proposals. Because if we don't do it now, if we don't do it in the next few weeks and months, we will miss the window. We do not want to miss the window. So I encourage you, I urge you to join with us. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Pernsteiner. And now we will have remarks from State Board Member Linda Chufetti. Please welcome her with me. Uh, before I begin, I need to say I don't often have my name pronounced correctly, so thank you very much. It was very good. As um, Robert said, I'm a member of the State Board of Higher Ed, and that's why I'm here with you today. But I do have another life, or a part of my life, and that is being professor and head of the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology at Oregon State University. My research area and my teaching area is center around molecular plant microbe interactions. And so uh, I do, I also teach the graduate students how to teach. And so I teach a course in teaching in the life sciences. So that's who I am aside from being a member of the State Board of Higher Ed. But of course I'm here, to you, here with you today in my role as a member of the board. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that we met with today. Uh, the, it was really a um, very good meeting, and I sincerely thank them for their valuable time and also their sincerity of comments. It was very good to hear from everyone, and I thank all of you for being here today and providing me the opportunity to say a few words. I must say I'd be lying if I stood up here and said to you that I'm not a bit intimidated standing here doing this, but because I, I am. Even though I can lecture in front of a crowd of 500, this is a little bit different. And so what I have done, and I hope you'll bear with me and give me a little bit of patience, I decided I should prepare a few remarks, a few remarks so I would be succinct and I wouldn't ramble on as respect of your time because most of the time we want here today is for you to be able to give us your thoughts, ask your questions, and for us to have some dialogue. dialogue. So please bear with me for a moment. I'm going to do two parts here very quickly. I'm just going to recap a little bit of the events that were taken by the State Board of Higher Ed and then talk a little bit about going forward. But in my role as the State Board, I feel I need to uh, comment on a few things. So um, <clears throat> Monday's vote has been uh, pre preceded by many efforts by the Board and the Chancellor to avoid having to take the path that we did. There have been many private conversations over past several months with the President and his advisors to achieve a di different outcome that would have been benefit to all. We understand, I understand, your, and, and respect your disappointment and your frustration with this decision. As this was a personal matter, the Board did make every effort to maintain confidentiality until the appropriate time. But please know this decision was not taken lightly. It was, not ma it was made with much deliberation and respect and made after many attempts to rectify a trust and communication issue over a long period of time. The board wants to encourage bold ideas and innovation particularly those that are consonant with Governor Kitzhopper's educational reform agenda and the state's ambitious 40-40-20 educational attainment goals. The Governance and Policy Committee of the State Board over the past few months, 
asked all of our seven OUS presidents to present their ideas for governance for their institution and the public university, the public university system overall. Uh, progress continues to be made. We are continuing to gather information and we're doing this by various uh, groups and forms and the institutional boards are being discussed as we speak. We're, this is going forward as our agenda at the moment. However, making such a significant change must be given due diligence by the public at large, by the board, by the governor, and other authorities that are charged with ensuring a higher education system that addresses all of Oregon's needs. Having said that, we also have to understand and think very clearly that one size does not fit all. The board, as I just said, continues to move forward with its deliberations on institutional boards and will be, be determining over the next few months what the powers and authorities of such boards would be, working through a public process and with input from all constituencies. So again, I'd like to say in closing, I, I realize, the board realizes, that this is difficult time for the U of O. I want you to know, and I hope you believe me when I say, that this is also a difficult time for the board as well. However, I truly believe this, the success of the University of Oregon does not rest with one person, or 10 people, or 100 people. Its success rests, collect rests collectively in all of you sitting here, it rests collectively with the other faculty who are not here, the students, the staff, the foundation members, the alumni, the donors, and everyone who supports the university and has made the university what it is today. This is your strength and what will support a great future for the U of O. The board looks forward to continued engagement with various U of O communities and discussions now focused on the future of U of O. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Linda, for your remarks. I've been asked to read a statement from the American Association of University Professors, and I would be remiss in my responsibilities today if I did not do this. It is important that every member of this community listens closely. We believe that the State Board's action is sharply at odds with fundamental standards of academic governance. As set forth in the enclosed Statement on Government of Colleges and Universities, the joint formulation of the American Association of University Professors, the American Council on Education, and the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges. Under these widely adopted standards, releasing a university president in the midst of a term of appointment should not be affected unilaterally by the governing body. We checked into this and the actual language uh, in the document is not in the midst of a term of appointment, but regardless of when. So regardless of when should not be affected unilaterally by the governing body. The AAUP's derivative, faculty participation in the selection, evaluation, and retention of administrators, also enclosed, states that, I quote, all decisions on retention and non-retention of administrators should be based on institutionalized and jointly determined procedures, which include significant faculty involvement." Close quote.
And now I would like to finish with respect to the president, I quote, the statement on government specifies that the, quote, leadership role of the president, quote, is supported by delegated authority from the board and faculty. <laughs> Hence, I quote, no decision on retention or non-retention should be made without an assessment of the level of confidence in which he or she is held by the faculty, close quote. We realize that you're sincere about wanting to form a, a new relationship with us. Perhaps we could call it a new partnership. <laughs> However, I think it's important to get everything out on the table, and um, that letter is very important to us, and I hope it is also to you. I've been in many meetings today, and I have to say, we are making positive steps forward. I really mean that, and I think you know that you can trust me. And so we will go forward now at the request of our president, and I will um, ask first the statutory faculty uh, to make their comments and remarks. They may ask questions of our guests. We have three mics. I will call this left, center, and right mic. If you would please come forward if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question and line up. And uh, each comment will be limited to two minutes. Um, yes, um, and then uh, after 15 minutes, people on the second floor will be uh, asked to make uh, their remarks and ask questions. We'll have roving mics on the second floor and we'll be rotating among the mics. So let's proceed now uh, with the first comment or question. Left mic, please identify yourself before you make your comment. My name is Jeffrey Hurwitt, and I have never been more proud to say that I am a Phil H. Philip H. Knight Professor of Art History and Classics. I had hoped to pose this question directly to the governor, but typically he is absent. So I will ask it of his representative, George Pernsteiner, the chancellor. At the very beginning of my first term as U of O Senate president in 1999, I invited then Governor Kitzhaber to attend any Senate meeting of his choice or to appear on campus at any time during that academic year to offer us and to discuss with us his vision for higher education generally and for the U of O in particular. He declined, claiming with, I am sure, sincere regret that his schedule for the following nine months was completely full. That year also saw funding increases to higher ed pushed through the state legislature by his political opponents over his objections. With that, I began to doubt the once and future governor's commitment to higher education in this state, doubts confirmed by his testy imperious and condescending policy statement of several days ago. Two days ago, the editorial staff of the Register Guard called his performance in the sphere of higher education lackluster. I believe that characterization flatters the governor too much. And so my question is this, what is there in the governor's long and undistinguished record that should give the faculty, students, staff, alumni, and friends of the U of O, any confidence that he has the best interests of the university or of higher education at heart? Why should we have any trust in him at all? Has he changed in any fundamental way? Response from Chancellor Pernsteiner and Board Member Chufetti. Thank you, President Keir. Thank you, Professor Hurwitt. Two points to make. 
One, I think, is a uh, clarification, and one is a, then a statement. I, I hesitate to speak for the governor. I have never been asked to do so before, so uh, you, you will take, uh, take this as w with that as the background. <laughs> the first thing is, in 1999, it is true. We did receive an increase in appropriation, and it is true that Senate President Brady Adams was largely responsible for the total size of that increase. And I recognize that because I was the one who had to help make that happen. But I will also say that the only reason that we even could have the conversation was that the governor had proposed in the first place a new approach to funding higher education and a new funding model and an increase, a noticeable increase in appropriation. So I think he did demonstrate leadership and commitment at that time. But I think I want to go to something much more recent. When he was running for governor and in the first few months of his term, what did he most focus on? He focused on health care, as you would expect, but he focused on education. It is a focus that is relentless in its intensity. I have never seen a governor as completely dedicated to one item and idea as he has been to the Oregon Education Investment Board, to the, the zero to 20, which is basically birth through PhD education effort. From a policy standpoint, he is absolutely committed. Our challenge going forward is to marry up that policy commitment with adequate funding. And that is, in fact, what we are going to attempt to do. Now, I did not speak for him there. That was me. <laughs> Linda? Yeah, actually, I don't think I need to add anything to that. I, I thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator Mike, please. Good afternoon, I'm Robert Melnick, professor of landscape architecture, and in my 30th year at the University of Oregon. From 95 to 205, I was dean of the School of Architecture and Allied Arts. I believe I know how universities run and how this university runs. Like others throughout the U of O community, and I mean the international community, I have been sickened and stabbed in the back by your actions. I will not pull punches here, George, and I doubt you would want me to do so. I can call him George, I've known him for years. You have acted in a way that shows total disregard, as we just heard, for the standard processes on this campus and in this state. You have sent the message that innovation, creativity, and excellence in higher education are really not welcomed in the state of Oregon. And you may not want to hear that, Linda, but I have already heard it from colleagues around the country and as far away as Prague. The word is out, that train has left the station. We have been told that the university should run like a satellite office of a large corporation. While we should and do have an excellent business plan, that analogy could not be further from reality. Even the suggestion of that reveals your lack of knowledge, your total lack of knowledge about an outstanding institution of higher ed. When I was dean, the College of Business had higher faculty salaries than did my school and it had a new building. Did I go running to the provost and president demanding they stop those, my colleagues from advancing themselves? When the law school got a new building, did I sulk and suggest it be torn down? Hardly. Like many other deans on this campus, I went back to my department heads and faculty and suggested that we look harder at what we were doing. My school is known nationally and internationally for its scholarship educational programs, and amazing faculty, students, staff, and alumni. We are not the best paid on this campus, nor do we have the best facilities. But should that mean that we seek to stop others from improving themselves? In a nutshell, this is how a mature university operates, and it is how the state system should operate. We should reward innovation and vision, not stop it. We should set the bar high, and then higher, not at the bottom. And we should never mistake management for leadership. Management is often having the trains. <laughs> Thank you.
Please bring your comments to a close. That Thank doesn't you. come out of my time. Management is often having the trains run on time and saying yes. Leadership is vision and inspiration and also having the trains run on time. I'm sorry the board doesn't get it, Linda. I'm sorry the governor doesn't get it, but I am appalled that the chancellor, who pretends to have an academic background, doesn't get it. This university, I, you know, this university needs to, needs to be supported, not pandered to. We need to be recognized as an excellent institution with our own mission, just as each of the state institutions has its own mission. We need to have a direct governing board that understands the particular needs and opportunities of the University of Oregon, a board that is not a pass-through to a state board. We need to have senior leadership. As student staff and faculty, we need to see, not just be told, that what we do every day of the year is truly valued. With the action of this week, you have said just the opposite. It is time now to, some, to make some truly positive decisions and take some positive actions. Richard, Richard Louvier had vision, and you threw him in the street. You threw all of us in the street. Where is your vision? What will you do today? After 30 years, I am tired of waiting. This is participatory democracy. Uh, next comment, uh, no one is at this mic, so we go back here to the left. George, just to be clear, Robert and I did not coordinate our comments, being people who previously worked with you. Sorry. How's that? Good. Please continue. I'm not sure why the board. Could you identify yourself, yeah, sorry. please? Joe Stone, professor of economics. 32 years. I'm not sure, George, why you and the board did not understand our president. He came to a system that was playing out a losing hand. You know it, I know it. Everyone here knows it. And the hand that was being, it was only a question of how long it could drag out. It could drag out as long as the, the University of Oregon is already at the lowest funding level per student. And uh, in this round of cuts took a sharply disproportionate share of the cuts in order to help spare the system. So as all of, a lot of the publicity was going around the state on the various things that our president was doing wrong and how selfish our campus and he was for the system. Never once was there a public statement from you that I, that I was aware of that stood up for the fact that this campus has worked very hard to put it itself in a position to contribute to the system as a whole. <laughs> and and just, just, just 30 seconds more. Our president came to the system. He, he understood quickly it was a losing hand. He also knew that the only way to change it was through doing something dramatic. It's pretty clear this is his beau geste. Now, I know you personally to be better than what's happened here, George. And I have little doubt that a professor from Oregon State, that I, would, I don't think either one of you will look back on this as perhaps the finest moment of your participation in higher education. But I'll speak directly to George, because I know it's tough for board members drawn out of their labs to be stuck on a board. There's time yet, George, for you to find your board's yes. You know, you're, we're both a lot closer to the end of our careers than we were when we started working together. Please, find every campus in the state system a way to a local governing board and I think the imagination, the creativity, and the inspiration of local leadership on every campus like, like our pre president has brought to ours can help them succeed. It's the only way we're going to succeed. The governor does not get that. Some 
oversight board with layers of bureaucracy simply will not do it. Thank you for listening, George. Thank you for your comments. Center mic, please. My name is Michael Thackeray. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Law and resident scholar at the Wayne Morris Center for Law and Politics. Um, so today, uh, Chancellor, uh, Ms. Member of the State Board, we heard you say that you understand that we care about our school and that you care. Words of motion and caring, there's a lot I hear today. It's about dialogue. And I don't believe you. I don't believe you. And the reason I don't believe you is the way this, all these decisions have been made. On Monday in Portland, Chancellor, you gave your recommendation, then the board heard from the public, and then it made its decision. It was a fait accompli, it was very clear. Today, I'm worried that dialogue will be smoke and mirrors, we'll have our say, we'll go back, you'll go back, and the decisions that have been made will just play out. You need to earn our trust at this point. We have no reason to trust you the way decisions have been made. And so with a sense of the future, I implore you to really listen and take a moment and appreciate it's not a personnel matter. Every time you say that, you discredit yourself. Today we've proven it is more than a personnel or a personal matter. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And now we move to the left mic, please. Oh, we have one over here uh, at the right mic, please. How you doing? My name's Andy L. Brown. I am the director of the Gospel Choirs and Ensembles here at our, uh, U of O, uh, four years. My question is, um, first of all, a statement. I've heard you say that you recognize and appreciate our uh, frustration and our need for progr uh, progression and uh, to resolve these issues. My question is, do you understand and appreciate it, appreciate it enough to, one, reinstate our president, and two, and two, allow him to continue the progress that he started here? I believe that it is a, um, a matter of letting our egos go so progress can be made. Thank you. Thank you, Andio. Response from Chancellor Pernsteiner. The board on Monday made its decision and that in, in my estimation, that decision is final. Board member Chufetti. Yes, and I, I have to agree with that. It is my feeling, and I spoke with uh, our president of the board, Matt Dunnigan, last night. Uh, wanted to make sure if that question was asked, I would be secure in my answer that what I was believing would be the case, and the decision will not be reconsidered by the board. There was uh, another part to Andiel's question, I believe. Um, uh, I think he asked something in, in addition to re reinstatement. Do you have an answer to that? I only have one question here, so I missed it, Robert. Okay, well, we'll move on then. Uh, let's go over to the left. When did you make the decision? When did you make the decision? When did you make the decision? He, he asked that. That was his question. Oh. In terms when of was it made? The decision, when I personally, you want to know when I personally made the decision? 
I've been working on thinking this through for six or eight months because if things weren't going to change, I was really concerned in the way that things would go. However, it's been over the past few months that we've been having conversations about breakdown in communication and in trust. Over the past, we're, I guess it's last week when everything started, a little bit before that, obviously I spent a lot of sleepless nights trying to go through all the data that I had and trying to figure out which way my decision would go. It may sound funny, but that's the way I do, thing. I'm, I do things. I'm very type A personality. And so I went into the meeting Monday night knowing that going into the meeting, I was not in support of continuing uh, from what I had. I was not in support in terms of continuing President LaRiviere's uh, contract. However, I also went into that meeting saying two things, and I, I promised that I would abide by these two things, and that was the following. If I heard anything there that I didn't know before I w went in, and it was significant, I would utilize that to make my decision. And the second thing that I said to myself, and I promised that I would do, if those things that I knew to be truth, the things I knew to be truth, were shown not to be, such that I had erroneous data, then that too would be a reason for me to ch consider in terms of being in support. I knew how much all of you or well, not all of you, but a lot of you uh, love your president. That wasn't a question. I know he's an extremely intelligent and innovative and hardworking man. That wasn't the question. For, the question was that was this situation appropriate and could we go forward with the situation given the breakdown of communication and trust? And I saw no reason let me restate that. I saw no, re yeah, no reasons that made me think that that was going to be different, especially given over the week before, Matt Donegan updated board members on individual basis on the communications and what was going back and forth and where we are and what was happening. And considering all of that, I did not consider that there was going to be much change. So I made my vote after you folks had the opportunity to provide the input that you wanted to. I, I, <laughs> that's fine. Why did you wait to call the public meeting until Robert, after the people raised questions? Have to bring this to order because we must uh, go and give people an opportunity to speak. So that's when I made my decision. when. Roll call was made, my name was called, inside of what I knew to be true, I made my decision. Left mic, please. My name is Priscilla Southwell. I am chair of the political science department at the University of Oregon. I've been here for 30 years. I am reading, I've been asked to read a statement from Congressman DeFazio of the 4th District of Oregon. I am deeply disappointed in the Oregon University Systems Board decision to remove Dr. Richard LaRiviere as the president of the University of Oregon. I am equally disappointed in the governor's strong support of this decision. It is no secret Oregon's approach to financing our university system has been broken for decades. State support for the U of O has dwindled to an abysmal 7% of its total budget and continues to decline. Since coming to the university, Dr. Derivere has been a strong advocate for public higher education. He has consistently said the U of O must be accessible, affordable, and just as importantly, a world-class academic institution. Oregon, Oregonians deserve no less. During his short tenure, fundraising at the U of O grew significantly. There is a renewed focus on academics campus-wide. Increased enrollment has provided greater stability for the institution, and there is a tangible improvement in faculty, staff, and student morale. These are outcomes that make all Oregonians proud. For over two decades, I have argued that Chancellor's office should be abolished.
Given the state's current financial reality, the money spent on this office is of little or no use to our system of higher education. I believe it has long <laughs> I believe it has long outlived its usefulness and is a vestige of a time when the state robustly funded our university system. This apparent management squabble has strengthened my resolve. This board, led by this chancellor, allowed themselves to be mired in a fight for control without appreciating the quality work happening at the U of O. Our state is lessened by not having Dr. Lariviere serve as the president of the University of Oregon but his leadership and his vision have created a path toward excellence that those who care about public higher education in this state should follow. Thank you, Congressman DeFazio. I hope that you will listen to him since you didn't listen to us on Monday. Statement from Peter DeFazio. I would like to acknowledge our state legislators who are here today Phil Barnhart, Nancy Nathanson, they would like to make a brief statement. Is it on? It's on. Yes. Uh, thank you, President Kerr, and thank you, faculty. We're very uh, glad to be here this afternoon. I want to be very brief and simply say that the remarks we've heard today, the remarks we've heard from uh, the uh, stakeholders and the university uh, ha has been heard very loudly and clearly by your delegation at the state legislature, uh, members of the House and members of the Senate. We intend to pursue these issues vigorously in our work. We hope that you and know that you will continue to pursue yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You can count on the fact that we will. Uh, we will now have uh, comments going from 15, if you look at the number 15 up there, there's a mic right there. Could you wave your hand, uh, the person with the mic, Lamar? He is the president of the Student Senate. And over here, 19, Harlan Meckling. He is on the Senate Executive Committee and he's from the ASUO. So uh, let's start over here. Uh, I see someone running to the mic. Yes. I was just advised to go easy. <laughs> My name is Caitlin Lang, and I am a proud University of Oregon senior. I study political science, and I'm minoring in business at this university. Ever since I've grown up, I've learned from adults around me. And since I've been at this institution, I have learned to love, to think, to question, and to just be a part of process. And I have to say, in the past two weeks, I have been nothing but saddened, angered, and confused over what I have seen from people who are supposed to be my role models. I am a political science major here. You are the epitome of what I'm supposed to grow up and be, and I don't want to be that. I apologize if I hurt your feelings just now. However, I am an ASUO senator. Here, this is where we learn. This is where we learn what process is. This is where we learn to debate. 
This is where we learn party lines, whatever those are. And I have been among debates where I've not understood what people are saying and I don't understand where they're coming from. But you know what I did? I sat and I listened. I opened my ears, I opened my heart, and I have stayed till 5 a.m. in a meeting with people who I do not degree, who do I do not agree on very much with. But you know what? Through thoughtful dialogue, meaningful dialogue, honest dialogue, and open minds, we have come to the best decisions I have ever seen at this university, and I have never been more proud to be a duck. Thank you all in this room for teaching me what I want to be one day. These are our students, and we can all be proud. That's why we're here. Um, I don't see anybody on this side. Is there anyone? Yes, please. Is it on? My name is Jackson Long. I'm a junior here at U of O. From a student's perspective, uh, Linda, you said that you made your decision uh, to terminate President LaRiviere La because of a breakdown in communication and a lack of trust with him. Uh, but with you all terminating him in the middle of his term, how can the students here trust you uh, to be communicating with us uh, in selecting a new president? Uh, Chancellor Pernsteiner, board member Chufetti. In the selection process, students will have an active voice as will faculty and staff and other university constituencies. That is something that we will do. Actually, we spent quite a bit of time on that in the other meetings today. So I, do you want me to take all that time now, Robert? Well, I think we, we need to make some response uh, out of respect. All right. Well, thank you for the question. There are a lot of issues about how to go forward with an active search for a president who can effectively lead the university on the path that I think we all agree it must take. Part of those questions depend upon the length of any interim appointment that might occur. Whatever approach we take, whenever we do it, my first step will be to consult with you about what that process should be. This, the, well, you have various constituencies, and I have asked uh, the Senate President if he would kindly agree that I could meet with some group within the Senate, and I will certainly consult with the students and others about how do we put together the process. Once you determine the process, the question then is, who serves in that process? What roles do they have? And those things will also be developed, as they were last time, in close cooperation with each of the constituent groups. Last time, we had a search committee of 25 people, but we had a closed search. This time, the question is, will we have an open search or a closed search? What are the, and we should actively discuss the pros and the cons of the, of the different approaches and come to a conclusion, that will then guide how we develop the process. But we will do it here with you in open communication to figure out the appropriate process. I'm sorry, we must go to the next question. Uh, I think everybody heard what he said. I, actually, I didn't. <laughs> he said, wonder, wonder if uh, we determine that we want the Riviere. Ah, OK. Would you like to respond? I was speaking about the process. And I think that it is important to make the determination of how we will approach things then it will be important to determine who will be part of figuring out things like the job description, the search process, and so forth. I was not talking about the outcome. 
Next question, please. Over there in, by door 15. My name is Connor Laskin, and I'm a freshman at the University of Oregon. And I just want the two members of the board to take a look at the decision they've made and the past decisions they've made and realize that perhaps your mold of what education should be in Oregon is antiquated. The times are changing in education and the University of Oregon is at the forefront in the state of Oregon. Le they're leading that change every day. And if you take a look at four years ago, we had 7,000 applicants and now we had 22,000 applicants this past year. We're a university that is becoming ever upward. I refuse to watch my colleagues and myself's degrees become devalued and merit to be put in the backseat of my professors. My name is Connor Laskin, and I'm a student at the University of Oregon, and President Richard Lurvier is my president. Would you like to make a response to that statement in any way? He didn't ask a question, but you can also make a response if you'd like. It is short. We want the value of a University of Oregon degree to improve, not to diminish. After all, I have children with them, too. Next question, door 19. My name is Daniel Strauss, and I'd like to defer the rest of my time to Professor Young, who's at the center mic, yet to speak. <laughs> Here we go. My name is Robert Young. I'm a professor in the Planning, Public Policy, and Management Department with Pride. Being a good academic, well, being an academic, um, I will quote. And the answer we received from a well-meaning liberal was the following. He said, would you ever imagine the manager of a firm making a statement publicly in opposition to his board of directors? That was the answer. Now I ask you to consider if this is a firm and if the board are the board of directors and if the president is in fact the manager, then I will tell you something else. The faculty are a bunch of employees and the students are the raw material. There is a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you cannot take part. You cannot even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels and upon the levers and upon all the apparatus. And you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you are free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. It's Mario Savio from the Berkeley Free Speech Movement in 64. The parallels are obvious. We are employees. They've made that very clear. We wear jackets and ties. We think better of ourselves in some ethereal way. But we are employees. When employees are denigrated, when they're ignored, when their voice is taken from them, they strike. I have, I believe you have, no confidence, not virtually no confidence, no confidence of the integrity or in the intentions of the people you know to which I am referring. <laughs> Therefore, I can make a projection, which is another thing we do as academics. The denigration will continue. The lack of voice will continue. Therefore, we must act as employees who have no voice, who are degraded. And if it continues, we put our bodies on the machine, we strike. As Phil Oaks said, you've got to fight, you've got to strike to get what you're owed. We strike, we shut it down, 
I do not implore, I do not plead, I do not ask. I say, we are employees, we have strength, they do not listen to our voice, we strike. Thank you very much. We'll have three more questions and then we'll go to the next point on the agenda. I'm so sorry, there are so many people who want to speak and uh, I know you each have something very valuable to say. Um, why don't we have a comment here from this mic and then one from this and one from this. My name is Beth Jelm and I'm a senior instructor in the College of Business. And notwithstanding all the comments about business, but in the College of Business, we teach about governance. Um, dare I say, we teach about lame duck boards. We teach about minority shareholders. And I would like the two of you, since my elected representatives are here, to say what you've learned about this process and what you're going to tell the legislature they should do about you. Because you are part of this issue, your governance problem. It is not all President LaRiviere's. It is, I want to know what you've learned about the dysfunctions within your own board. <laughs> Chancellor Pernsteiner and Board Member Cersetti. Thank you for the question because it gives me an opportunity to again say that I am committed to communicating directly and better with you. I've, I've told that to the Senate President. I say it to you. We will, in fact, open better dialogue and better communication. To the point of governance, we have, in fact, a process going on now, a robust process that, in fact, will lead to a recommendation that I suspect that, that I will be bringing to our board or our governance committee will, that will involve the establishment of some institutional boards. And I say some because not all of the campuses want institutional boards. That discussion is going on now. That discussion is into a, a variety of both policy and detail questions, and it will continue for some period of months. Based upon that, we will have our conversations with the governor and the legislature. Please participate in those discussions. What have you learned about yourself, she asks. What have you learned about your board? Will it be disbanded and will those um, universities in the system that are smaller uh, have the opportunity to go their way? Each have the right of self-determination, a basic human right in my view. That question was put to the presidents of all of the institutions in the early fall. Their answers varied. That discussion was held again two weeks ago, and it will continue to be held in the confines of the Governance and Policy Committee. It is not appropriate. Talk about yourself. That's what uh, the. Oh, remark about myself? Here. I, what have you learned, you, the human being, <laughs> our chancellor? What have you personally learned? We're educators here. We talk about what we learn all the time yes, with our students, with each other. <laughs> We're asking you what you have learned. Thank you. I have learned that I need to communicate better. I have learned 
that I needed to work harder with each of the presidents in order to ensure that they were working together effectively. I have learned that I must do that in future. But as you think, and we have another question for you. I just want to, this has been asked of me okay. to ask. Well, hey, I'm asking it <laughs> on my own. In going forward and in formulating any boards or anything that we do from here on, will you follow the codes set by American Association of University Professors, the American Council on Education, and the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges, which we ascribe to. You will note. Answer the question, please. You, you, you will note we in need the your second promise. to the last paragraph of what you read before that it calls for the development jointly of the policies and procedures and approaches, and I am committed to working with you to do that. And following the codes set down by those bodies, because we ascribe to them and we want to make sure we're on the same page with you since obviously they have written to you saying that there were some, we'll call them breaches. We want to operate in good faith with you, and these are in a sense our mediators. And I want to operate in good faith with you. And I will sit down with you to go through those as well as our current policies and procedures, rules and IMDs, and try to find a way that all of them can be brought together effectively. The answer really, the answer really is what I've been saying all afternoon. For us to be effective for Oregon, all of us, we need to work together. It does no, it, it makes no. Okay, uh, I, I'm going to bring the meeting to order. Um, thank you for your response. Uh, two more questions, one from 15 and one from 19, please. Hello? Okay. Uh, my name is Paul Kammerzelt. Um, I was at the meeting on Monday. It's wonderful to see your faces again. Um, President, President Donegan, just a little side note, President Donegan offered to meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I've sent him an email. If you see him before I do, could you let him know I'm still waiting? Um, I will do that. Thank you. It should be in his inbox. Pcameras at uoregon.edu. Okay. Um, kind of the issue that I see is President LeRiviere and many other people see, as yourselves included, see a problem with higher education in the state. President LeRiviere brought forward issues. He did some things that maybe we don't all agree with. I don't think everyone here would agree with everything that he brought forward. What I see as the problem is a re the board chose to remove a whistleblower instead of address a problem. And, and I hear that there are steps that will be made to address the problem. Uh, board, uh, board Director Linda, I'm sorry, I forget your last name. Chufetti. Um, Linda is fine. Okay, thank you. Um, you spoke about a, there was an erosion or a dissolution of trust between the board and President LeRiviere, and that ended in the termination of his contract. I think I speak for more than just myself here when I say as the university we see kind of a little bit of an erosion of trust with the board and wonder what the outcome of that erosion of trust will be. Response, please. I have no idea what the outcome of that erosion of trust will be. And in terms of... Do we have a say in that? The outcome. 
I, I'm answering the gentleman out there who asked me a question. In terms, I don't see going through the policies and going through how we deal with board and how we deal with everything that we need to do legally, et cetera. There is nothing at this moment that causes me to pause and to say that I should resign from the board. And so I won't resign from the board. I, I have worked very hard for the students and the faculty and the state of Oregon since I've been on the board. I believe in excellence of education, research, and outreach. I don't plan to resign. I believe that the right approach was taken, and I will tell you this. I am not going against any of the innovative comments or, or ideas that the president had, but many of you may have been supervisors. I don't know, you may be supervisors for people in your lab. You may be bought, you know, various chairs, heads, deans, a lot of people that are out here, even students, our bosses probably to undergrads in their labs or where they work. It is great to have a person that everyone loves. We all can get along with. I got along very well with President LaRiviere. And it is absolutely fine, but when you are the superior or the supervisor or the person who they're supposed to interact with, and you no longer have trust in that what is agreed upon will be carried through, I don't think many of you would keep that person around working for you either. One more question and then we will go to motions. We'll take one more from the statutory faculty then actually to finish. Uh, we should do that appropriately. Please, Harlan. Please, uh, first here, door 19, and then we'll finish with uh, Leah. Thank you. Um, my name is Cimarron Gillespie. I'm uh, in the political science department. I've been at the university for six years now. Um, I want to thank the members of the State Board of Higher Education for coming down here. Um, and a couple things. One, uh, this year the university um, introduced a number of policies which were, uh, one of which was, um, uh, I believe, not supportive to survivors of sexual assault. I think they've introduced a policy um, which has um, a proposal which would create a local governing board that would place uh, five of the eight voting hands uh, in basically private corporations and that the uh, central administration has worked to disband OMAS, the Office of Multicultural Academic Support, and try to combine it with some other um, organization that's not able to meet the needs of any of the students. I think that's three strikes and the university president deserved to be fired. Second, I think that the process of the firing made no more sense than the university president's hiring. He was hired in a closed door, chosen as if he was some dictator from the previous president, Fronmeyer. So I agree with your decision. I disagree with your process of firing him between closed doors. Um, also, this is a public institution. And it says in the mission of the university that this shall remain a institution of affordable public higher education. So I have three questions for you. One, in moving forward uh, to hire a new president, Are you willing to resign yourself in the process of creating an open board and establishing trust? Two, 
would such a process be interested in hiring someone who's actually willing to follow the mission of the University of Oregon, the stated mission of the University of Oregon? And, sorry, sorry. And also, um, as per the American Association of Universities, um, that faculty should be involved in the decision to terminate the president. Again, I will ask for the second reason um, of not involving the faculty. Are you willing to resign on the principle that is those who work in the university ought to be the ones to govern it? Response, please. Under the laws of the state of Oregon, it is not just, or even solely, or even mostly, those who work in the university who determine the hiring and the firing of the president. It is solely in the province of the State Board of Higher Education. Under the statutes of the state of Oregon, that responsibility, that authority, does not reside <coughs> anywhere else. When I mentioned a bit ago that I am willing to sit down with the Senate Executive Committee or whoever else you designate to determine how to harmonize the laws, the rules of the state of Oregon with the AAUP principles, I meant just that. But I don't know what the specific outcome of that will be. With respect to will we seek a president who will follow the mission of the institution, who will advance its mission in the totality of that mission, the answer is unequivocally yes. It is essential that we do that, but it is essential also that we recognize the nuance of the mission in terms of what this university has become. This university has become, since that mission was originally developed, one of the preeminent research institutions in this country and the world. That too must be recognized. So affordable access is very important, and we are committed to that, and we will seek a president who is committed to that. But excellence and in both education and research also are essential, and we are committed to that. And if you're asking me, pardon me? What about keeping it public? Yes, it must be public. What happens if it isn't public? You've got a real problem in this state if you don't continue to have it as a public institution. It is essential that all the institutions in this state remain public, remain committed to a public mission, remain committed to raising the education level of Oregonians, remain committed to make sure that no matter where you are in Oregon, you have an opportunity for success, no matter who you are, no matter where you are. That, is, that demands a public mission. That will demand more funding. That will demand more public funding. We know that too. Thank you if for your comment. Uh, last question from this mic to my left. Leah Middlebrook. Good afternoon. My name is Leah Middlebrook. I'm an associate professor in comparative literature and romance languages. Closer. <laughs> I'm an associate professor of comparative literature and romance languages. I'm also director of pedagogy and comparative literature and my question actually has to do with teaching. Um, I'm sure you know, and if you didn't know already, you know now that this is Dead Week at the University of Oregon. And Dead Week is a week that is so important to us on the quarter system that we have strict policies regulating what faculty can ask of students during this week. And the reason that we have these policies are because we need our students to be preparing for finals. And even more than we need our students to be preparing for finals right now, we need our faculty to be focused on our students as they prepare for finals. Um, the undergraduates here, as you know, the undergraduates at all the Oregon institutions are under pressures that are nothing like the pressures that I was under when I was in college. I would imagine that you're in the same position. They hold jobs. They are taking extra loads of credit. Some of them are, many of them in fact, are on scholarships that require a B average. Um, I'm not going to ask the board if the rush to terminate, if in the rush to terminate President LaRiviere, 
you took the timing of this decision into account. I'm not going to ask you that. But um, the events of this past week have had such an effect and have been such a disruption and a distraction to our students, to our undergrads, um, that I think it would be really helpful for us as a community to hear from you um, where it is you see the students themselves uh, as a priority as you make your decisions and form your policies. I think we've heard a lot this week about money and we've heard a lot about authority and chains of command, but I would really appreciate hearing specifically about when you take the actual students into account uh, as you make these decisions. Response, please. Well, from my point of view, the students are everything at a university, otherwise none of us would be here, okay? And so I look at them as the bloodline of the university. And the students were taken into consideration when we took into consideration all of the OUS institutions and the harm that could potentially happen if certain things didn't occur for all institutions. The students themselves are constantly talked about in various subcommittees of the board and their knowledge and their ability to be able to attain the highest quality education in the state of Oregon that they can attain is the number one priority of the board. So we think about students all the time. That's why we're all here and everything is focused on the students. Uh, please, uh, Chancellor Pernsteiner. Thank you. The, the timing of this action was driven in large measure by the requirements under, of, the date due, of the various dates within President LaRiviere's contract. That required that he be notified prior to the end of the calendar year. Those discussions began occurring last week or a week before now, whenever, uh, between him and board leadership. Uh, with regard to trying to determine a course going forward. It was because we were very near the end of the year that the matter was taken up now. Thank you for your response and I want you to know that, um, and I'd like to speak for everybody, we very much respect your coming here and speaking with us. This is a great first step toward building better communication and real trust and we're committed to doing that and going forward in a way that will work best for the University of Oregon and all of Oregon. And that means all of the universities in the system. So we will now proceed quickly to the new business. Uh, motions, the first motion is on the replacement of Richard LaRiviere, placed by the Senate Executive Committee. Ian McNeely from History will present. Thank you. I'm Ian F. McNeely, Chair of the University of Oregon Academic Council and Associate Professor of History. On December 2nd, 1987, exactly 24 years ago this Friday, this body took a near unanimous vote of no confidence in the Chancellor and State Board of Higher Education for their decision to fire University of Oregon President Paul Olam, a bold, beloved and indisputably accomplished leader and former scientist on the Manhattan Project. Yesterday I requested that this document be retrieved from the university archives and hold it up now. Many of its signatories are among us today including those who have spoken up against the similar outrage just visited upon President La Riviere, and I wish to thank them and indeed thank you all for standing up to demand reasoned dialogue about the future of our university. The motion I'm about to present is adapted directly from the 1987 resolution. Large parts of it, approximately the first two-thirds, have simply been copied word for word. In the motion, we condemn the chancellor and the board's decision, but stop short of a vote of no confidence for the moment. 
We as individuals may lack confidence in the current chancellor and board, and I count myself certainly among that number. They have failed in their stewardship of an entire university system whose reform is decades overdue. But as a faculty, we must retain the ability to negotiate with those who, for the moment, still have the legal, but not the moral, power to control our fate. Hence the differences between the 1987 motion, whose logic and conviction, alas, went unacknowledged by the university system's leaders at the time, and our motion today. And now, with your permission, I'll read it out. Whereas the State Board of Higher Education and its Chancellor have acted to terminate the employment of Richard LaRiviere as President of the University of Oregon, and whereas they have undertaken this action without any advanced consultation with the faculty and students of the University of Oregon, and then over the repeated expressions of protest from the faculty, students, staff, alumni and alumni, and friends of the University of Oregon, and whereas they have as a group declined to engage in reasoned dialogue with the university community and have thereby confounded the traditions of argument and persuasion on which higher education is based, and whereas they have acted in defiance of testimony that their action will bring enduring injury to the University of Oregon, and whereas they have provided the citizens of the state of Oregon with no credible reasons for their action until compelled to do so, and whereas they have indicated by their action their lack of respect for the president, faculty, staff, students, alumni and alumni, and friends of the University of Oregon, and whereas the University of Oregon statutory faculty condemns the chancellor and state board of higher education for their decision to terminate President Riviere and for the process by which they reached this decision, be it resolved that the statutory faculty directs the University Senate, working with the University Administration and the State Board, or whatever board may succeed it as the legal authority that appoints the University of Oregon President, to establish a search committee with strong university rep representation to locate a suitable permanent replacement for President LaRiviere. The motion is placed. Do I hear a motion to discuss? Second the motion. Discussion. Uh, you may make a comment from the mic if you wish. So this is probably a comment that was addressed to the previous discussion, but since it's all related, um, Yin is another senator who also uh, stood up with me at the end of the previous discussion, and we felt probably as foreigners uh, and professors at the University of Oregon. Uh, Speak name, closer to the mic, my please. My name is Pedro Garcia Caro, Roman's language is assistant professor. I'm Yin Tan, associate professor of art. And, and we felt uh, a bit as uh, foreign observers to another kind of civil war, which is what you call here your football matches between OSU and University of Oregon. And that's partly because the current Board of Higher Education is mainly made up by people related to the OSU University campus, including some of their major donors. And we are just puzzled as uh, Martians uh, why is this not raised? Why has no one in the press, even though the bios of everyone on that board have been underlined, has no one raised the question first? Why is there no University of Oregon representative on that board now? And <laughs> and as a matter of fact, permanently, two members at least, I would imagine. And second, why are some major donors related to the College of Forestry, some of the major donors, OSU, your president and your board, sir, is a major investor in forestry, amounts much to like having Phil Knight sit in your board, sir, and dismiss OSU's president. 
So why is this not being raised? Thank you for making the comment. Uh, we're now, uh, thank you so much, but we are now in the section devoted to motions. Uh, please, let's focus on the topic. Um, do I hear a motion to move to a vote? Yes, a second? All in favor of the motions say aye. All opposed, nay. Abstain. The motion is so passed. Thank you so much, Ian. The next motion is for the establishment of a UO Board of Trustees. This is placed by the Senate Executive Committee. Peter Keyes Architecture will present. Peter. Hello, I'm Peter Keyes from the Department of Architecture and according to the sign over here, a professor. And I'd like to thank the statutory faculty for this promotion with deep gratitude and humility. Um, it will save me a long and tedious promotion process, I'm sure. Maybe we could have a quick motion. If we get through with this, we could deal with that next. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm representing the uh, uh, Senate Executive Committee here and I'm presenting a motion uh, for the faculty assembly to vote on a process for forming a University of Oregon board. And I, after this presenting the motion, I'd like to sort of address some remarks towards the motion. The UO faculty assembly directs the Senate Executive Committee, or an ad hoc Senate committee, to be appointed by the Senate President to initiate negotiations with state legislative leaders and the Oregon State Board of Higher Education, or its successor, leading to the appointment of a University of Oregon Board of Trustees. The scope of issues to be engaged in the discussion of the powers of this board shall include, but shall not be limited to, one, the composition and appointment process of the board, two, operational oversight of the university, three, setting of tuition and fees, four, budgetary control, five, contract negotiations and contract authority, six, bonding authority, seven, acquisition of property, eight, status of legal counsel, nine, construction of buildings, 10, authority over the hiring and firing of the president of the U of O, and 11, hiring and personnel policies for faculty and staff. Thank you, Peter. Do I hear a motion for discussion? And second, uh, discussion at the mic. Uh, Peter would like to speak, yes? Thank you. I'd like to address why the Senate Executive Committee has brought this motion forward to this body. First of all, why the statutory faculty? The, the authority of this university is vested in the faculty and the president, the professors and the president by the state charter. This cannot be changed by the State Board of Higher Education. The Senate might be abolished by some authority or by a president who's put in place as recently happened in Idaho, but the authority of you, the statutory faculty, of this university cannot be abolished by any power other than a legislative action. So it's very important that we take the stand on this as a faculty and not simply as a Senate. So why this motion? Board President Donegan cited a lack of trust with our President Richard LeRiviere, but the trust between that board and the UVO community is irrevocably broken, I would say at this point. I'm gonna give... I'm going to give the board the benefit of the doubt for a moment and say that, as they averred repeatedly at the meeting in Portland on Monday, that they do want the best for the UVO. They have our best interests as an institution at heart. But frankly, even given that, they still have no idea what is going on here. Uh, the, board, the board president, Donegan, kept trying to count how many times and tell us how many times he had visited the campus, and he was really reduced to how many football games he had gone to. That was the thing he kept coming back to. And I don't think this is actually necessarily a failing of the board. It's not that they don't know what's going on, it's that they can't know what's going on. A board that is that distance, that is made of volunteers, that operates out of Portland, that has day jobs, they really can't be enough evolved in the operations of our university in any way to make any meaningful decisions. And so I think it's necessary we have a board that can focus on the University of Oregon and understand our issues.
The board vice president referred to, and this is a, not a direct quote because there are no meaning, minutes out from the meeting yet and I couldn't back up the video far enough to the right place, but she referred to a seamless post-secondary education delivery system. Those are the words of someone who spent too much time in the halls of corporate America, not someone who's been on a university campus in a very long time. I want to make a deal. I won't tell the vice president of the board how they should run Intel, and I don't want her to tell us how we should run a university. So, so the question is, what is this goal that we're trying to achieve, this unattainable, seemingly holy grail of self-determination? It is something that every school district and every community college in the state of Oregon already has. Let me repeat that. Every school district in the state, by the way, which are mainly funded from state coffers, has an independent board that runs that school district. And the University of Oregon, which gets you know, funding from the state in the single digits, does not have such a thing. So I, I promise to this faculty that if we try to push forward with this motion and negotiate with the, the state board to arrive at a, an arrangement for an independent board for our uh, university and we fail, I will come back to this faculty and I'll put forward a motion to change the name of this institution to the Community College of Oregon. And that way, we will get our regulatory board. So finally, Board President Donegan repeatedly asserted that the dispute was not about policy, that he and many board members were in favor of local boards. Great, that is great. We need to move forward now. We need to not wait for five years for everything to shake out, for the Governor's Oregon Education Investment Board to figure out who they are and what their larger goals in the world are, or for the new uh, ed higher education coordinating council to get their act together or for the state board of, of the university system to change their name once again. We've, this system has been in decline for 20 years and nothing has happened. The U of O is on a roll and we can't wait for them to catch up. It's time for them to lead, follow, or get out of the way. Further discussion? Do I hear a motion to vote? Second? All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. Abstain? So moved. We're now approaching five o'clock. We have one more motion to place. Uh, which was placed here at the table. Um, I would like to ask for a motion to extend the session. So moved. Do I hear a second? The session is now extended. Um, we'll give it uh, 15 minutes. Um, this is a motion from Waxin Lin. Um, he will come up and identify himself and describe the motion, but I will read it. Uh, the University of Oregon statutory faculty move that SBHE invites University of Oregon Senate and its executive committee to provide a formal candidate for interim president of the University of Oregon. Waxin Lin, please. This is Hua Xingling from uh, Math Department. I'm uh, currently Senate. Um, I want to make it as a brief, since it's only late. I just repeat what I said, that as uh, uh, <coughs> Robert already uh, stated, since it's, uh, so let me say that, <coughs> so we move the statutory assembly requests the State Board of Higher Education invites you owe Senate or its executive committee to provide a formal candidate for the interim president of the University of Oregon. Do I hear a motion for discussion? Motion for discussion? Yes? 
Second. Uh, amendment uh, is proposed. Um, second for the motion, for the amendment, excuse me. Second, yes. Um, Ian McNeely. I'm going to propose that we change um, the UO Senate and its executive committee to the UO Senate or its executive committee. Simply because time is of the essence, I don't know if we can convene the Senate uh, in time to render a candidate, but we've had extensive discussions on the executive committee, uh, can carry, extend those discussions as widely as possible, both within the Senate and beyond to the entire university community, uh, but we need the authority to act on this motion uh, because time is of the essence. He accepts it, so we don't need to vote on it. Um, do I hear a motion to vote? Second? All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. Abstain? The motion is so moved. Bravo. Uh, I'm, I'm just told that there's one more motion uh, from Bill Harbaugh. Hello, I'm Bill Harbaugh, professor of economics. This is a simple motion. The UO faculty requests that the OUS board hold an executive and a public meeting and a public vote on the question of renewal or non-renewal of the OUS Chancellor's employment before the December 31st deadline in his current contract. Do I hear a motion for discussion? Motion for discussion? Second? No. We have a dis uh, do I hear a motion to vote? A second? All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. Abstain? The motion is so moved. So now we come to the end of our meeting. There are two more announcements, very important one. Uh, the first uh, is a statement that I've been asked to read relating to the university archives. Uh, this is an important statement. The University of Oregon Libraries Special Collections and University Archives is aggressively collecting phys physical and electronic materials related to the termination of President LaRiviere and the official records of his presidency. If you are acting in an official university capacity, your correspondence and documentation are public records and you are required to contribute them to the university archives. If you have any other related materials that help illustrate the campus climate, including banners, photographs, videos, and blogs, please contact Kira Homo. The library is also set up an, uh, the, oh, the library has also set up an online archive as part of Scholars Bank, the university's institutional repository to which you are all invited to contribute. Uh, so please be in touch with that part of the university to follow through on that. Um, one more announcement. Um, I'd like to ask everyone who is here today and anyone who you would please bring along from your constituency to be here next week, December 7th, Wednesday at 3 p.m. here in Mac Court for a very, very important faculty assembly to ratify our revised constitution. Your presence is greatly needed uh, for this momentous occasion. And uh, in addition, we will entertain other motions if they are so placed prior to that time. So we look forward to seeing you here next week at 3 p.m. 
Thank you so much for your participation today. This is what our university is about, shared governance, open communication, consultation, and now we go forward as our president has asked us to do. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? A second? The meeting is adjourned.